This is Mike from FearShop.com. Make sure you like this video and leave your comments. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to set up notifications so you know when the next video drops. Let's get into it. Thanks for checking out this Halloween deep dive. I want to take you on a journey into my thoughts on the original Halloween film from 1978. This slasher film did so much for the horror genre, and a lot of people do not recognize the value that Halloween has for the genre as a whole. Halloween is a 1978 American slasher film directed and scored by John Carpenter, co-written with producer Deborah Hill, and starring Donald Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis in her film debut. Just listen to some of those names. Donald Pleasance played no better role in his long career than Dr. Sam Loomis. His career dates back to the 50s in film and television, and Pleasance has a long history of amazing roles in small and large films. I cannot even begin to scratch the surface on the classics that he was in, but outside of his work in the Halloween franchise, I loved his role in Dario Argento's Phenomena from 1985 as well. If you know Argento beyond just Suspiria, then you probably know Phenomena as well. But if not, you should check out this gem starring Pleasance and a young Jennifer Connelly in our only or second film role. Jamie Lee Curtis became what most people call the preeminent screen queens in a lot of genres fans eyes. After her debut in Halloween, she went on to star in The Fog, Prom Night, Terror Train, Road Games, and Halloween 2, of course. She even had an uncredited role as a, doing a voice cameo in Halloween 3 Season of the Witch as a telephone operator. She then went on to film such as Trading Places, A Fish Called Wanda, and so many other non-horror films. A young Jamie Lee Curtis was so disappointed with her performance that she became convinced she'd be fired after only the first day of filming. When her phone rang that night and it was John Carpenter on the phone, Curtis was certain it was the end of her movie career. Instead, Carpenter called to congratulate her and tell her that he was very happy with the way things had gone. She definitely went a long way after that. Also, although all the girls in the movie play teenagers, star Jamie Lee Curtis was the only actual teenager. Michael Myers was primarily played by actor Nick Hassel, who was Carpenter's friend from USC Film School and who would go on to co-write Carpenter's 1981 film, Escape from New York. But he also played by production designer Tommy Lee Wallace whenever needed. When Myers is unmasked at the end of the film, he's played by actor Tony Moran, who would go on to appear in guest spots on TV shows like The Waltons and Chips. Moran was paid $250 for a day's work and a single shot in Halloween. John Carpenter intentionally gave Michael Myers actor Nick Castle minimal direction about how to play the killer. During the scene where Myers kills his victim by impaling him against the wall, he told Castle to tilt his head like he's observing a corpse. Producer Deborah Hill had a ridiculous amount of quality films under her belt, with a lot of those being John Carpenter directed films. Of course, John Carpenter needs no introduction to horror fans. Before Halloween, he directed Dark Star and Assault on Precinct 13, but after Halloween, he directed The Fog, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Starman, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Dark as They Live, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, Body Bags and the Mouth of Madness, Village of the Damned, Escape from LA, Vampires and Ghosts of Mars. Nearly 10 years later, he directed The Ward, which was a good movie as well. All these great films, and we have not even talked about his movie scores. What do you remember about Halloween? The Shape Michael Myers, His Knife, and the iconic score. The plot from Halloween tells us about a mental patient who was committed to a sanitarium for murdering his teenage sister on Halloween night when he was six years old. Fifteen years later, he escapes and returns to his hometown, where he stalks a female babysitter and her friends while under pursuit by a psychiatrist. Filmed in Southern California in May of 1978, Halloween premiered in October of 1978 and grossed $70 million, becoming one of the most profitable independent films. Halloween is not the first slasher movie made, but it gets a lot of credit for modernizing slasher films. It's one of the first movies in a long line of slasher films inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, 
and Bob Clark's Black Christmas. In 1987, the Myers home was relocated from its location at 709 Meridian Avenue in southern Pasadena after it was slated to be demolished. The home is now located at 1000 Mission Street in South Pasadena and has been named a historic landmark in the city of South Pasadena, not only because of its cinematography history, but also because the house itself dates back to 1888 and is thought to be the oldest surviving residential structure in the city. There have been many a critic who suggested that Halloween may be a social critique on the immorality of youth and teenagers in 70s America, with many of Meyer's victims being sexually promiscuous substance abusers, and the lone heroine is depicted as innocent and pure, hence her survival. Carpenter dismisses such analyses. Halloween spawned a film franchise comprised of 11 films and almost as many timeline shifts. The franchise over time developed an extensive backstory for its antagonist Michael Myers. A remake was released in 2007 and directed by Rob Zombie who also directed a sequel in 2009. An 11th installment which serves as a direct sequel to the original film that retcons all previous sequels was released in 2018. Another sequel to that installment, Halloween Kills, is scheduled for release on October 16, 2020. Additionally, a novelization, a video game, a comic book series have been based on the film. In 2006, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. After viewing Carpenter's film, Assault on Precinct 13, in 1976 at the Milan Film Festival, independent film producer Erwin Yablans and financer Mustafa Akkad sought out Carpenter to direct a film for them about a psychotic killer that stalked babysitters. They were looking to make a film that would have the same impact as The Exorcist. Carpenter agreed to direct the film as long as he had full creative control and he was paid $10,000 for his work which included writing, directing, and scoring the film. He and his then-girlfriend, Deborah Hill, began drafting a story originally titled The Babysit Murders. Yablon subsequently suggested setting the movie on Halloween night and naming it Halloween instead, to which Carpenter agreed and developed the story. The screenplay was written in 10 days. Yablon's offered several suggestions to the screenplay, such as wanting the script written like a radio show with booze every 10 minutes. The script was written in three weeks, and much of the inspiration behind the plot came from Celtic traditions of Halloween, such as the Festival of Samhain, although Samhain is not mentioned in the plot of the first film. Hill, who had worked as a babysitter during her teenage years, wrote most of the female character's dialogue, while Carpenter drafted Loomis' speeches on the soullessness of Michael Myers. Many script details were drawn from Carpenter and Hill's own backgrounds, and early careers. The fictional town of Haddonfield, Illinois was derived from Haddonfield, New Jersey, where Hill was raised, while several of the street names were taken from Carpenter's hometown of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Laurie Strode was allegedly the name of one of Carpenter's old girlfriends, while Michael Myers was the name of an English producer who had previously entered, along with Yablon's, Assault and Pre-Scene 13 in various European film festivals. Homage is paid to Alfred Hitchcock with two characters named Tommy Doyle, who's named after Lieutenant Detective Thomas J. Doyle from Rear Window, and Dr. Loomis' name was derived from Sam Loomis, played by John Gavin from Psycho, the boyfriend of Marion Crane, played by Janet Lee, who's the real-life mother of Jamie Lee Curtis. Sheriff Laybracket shared the name of a Hollywood screenwriter and frequent collaborator of Howard Hawks. In devising the backstory for the film's villain Michael Myers, Carpenter drew on haunted house folklore that existed in many small American communities. Carpenter's inspiration for the evil that Michael embodied came from a visit he had taken during college into a psychiatric institution in Kentucky. There he visited a ward with his psychology classmates where the most serious mentally ill patients were held. Among those patients was an adolescent boy who possessed a blank schizophrenic stare. John Carpenter's intent with the character of Michael Myers was that the audience should never be able to relate to him. 
Carpenter's experience inspired the characterization that Loomis gave of Michael to Sheriff Brackett in the film. The ending scene of Michael being shot six times and then disappearing after falling off the balcony was meant to terrify the imagination of the audience. Carpenter tried to keep the audience guessing as to who Michael Myers really is. Carpenter described Halloween as true crass exploitation. I decided to make a film I would love to have seen as a kid, full of cheap tricks like a haunted house, an affair where you walk down the corridor and things jumped out at you. The cast of Halloween included veteran actor Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis. The role was originally intended for Peter Cushing, who had recently appeared as Grand Moff Tarkin in Star Wars from 1977. Cushing's agent rejected Carpenter's offer due to the low salary. Christopher Lee was approached for a role. He also turned it down, although the actor later told Carpenter and Hill that declining a role was the biggest mistake he made in his career. Yablins then suggested Pleasance, who agreed to star because his daughter Lucy, a guitarist, had enjoyed Assault on Precinct 13 for Carpenter's score. Pleasance was the highest paid actor in Halloween getting paid $20,000. Nick Castle earned $25 a day. Then unknown actress Jamie Lee Curtis received $8,000. She was also not the first choice to play Laurie Strode. Curtis was 19 at the time and in a TV show but Carpenter did not watch TV, so he had not seen her work. Carpenter originally wanted to cast Anne Lockhart, the daughter of June Lockhart from Lassie, as Laurie Strode. However, Lockhart had commitments to several other film and television projects. Deborah Hill realized how much publicity casting the daughter of psycho actress Janet Lee could bring to the film. Another relatively unknown actress, Nancy Keys, credited in the film as Nancy Loomis, was cast as Laurie's outspoken friend Annie Brackett, daughter of Haddonfield Sheriff Lee Brackett. Keys had previously starred in Assault on Precinct 13, as had Cyphers, and happened to be dating Halloween's art director Tommy Lee Wallace when filming began. Carpenter chose PJ Souls to play Linda Vanderklok another friend of Laurie's best remembered in the film for the dialogue peppered with the word totally. Souls was an actress known for her supporting role in Carrie in 1976 and her minor part in The Boy in the Plastic Bubble also in 76. According to Souls, she was told after being cast that Carpenter had written the role with her in mind. Souls' then husband, actor Dennis Quaid, was considered for the role of Bob Sims Linda's boyfriend, but was unable to perform the role due to prior work commitments. The role of the shape, as the masked Michael Myers character was billed in the end credits, was played by Nick Castle, who befriended Carpenter while he attended the University of South Southern California. After Halloween, Castle became a director, taking the helm of films such as The Last Starfighter, The Boy Who Could Fly, Dennis the Menace, and Major Pain. Tony Moran, plays the unmasked Michael Myers at the end of the film, Moran was a struggling actor before he got the role. Moran is the brother of Aaron Moran, who played Joni Cunningham on Happy Days. Moran was paid $250 for his appearance. Will Sandon played the unmasked Michael Myers in the beginning of the film. Carpenter also provided uncredited voice work as Paul and his boyfriend. Mustafa Akkad agreed to put up $300,000 for the film's budget which was considered low at the time. Carpenter's previous film, Assault on Precinct 13, had an estimated budget of $100,000. Akkad worried over the tight four-week schedule, low budget, and Carpenter's limited experience as a filmmaker. Because of low budget, wardrobe and props were often crafted from items on hand or that could be purchased inexpensively. Carpenter hired Tommy Lee Wallace as a production designer, art director, location scout, and co-editor. Wallace created the trademark mask worn by Michael Myers throughout the film from a Captain Kirk mask purchased for $1.98 from a costume shop on Hollywood Boulevard. Carpenter recalled how Wallace widened the eyes, the eye holes, and spray painted the flesh to a bluish white. In the script it said Michael Myers' mask had the pale features of a human face. Many of the actors wore their own clothes and Curtis's wardrobe was purchased at JCPenney for around $100. Wallace described the film process as uniquely collaborative, with cast members often helping move equipment, cameras, and helping facilitate setups. 
In regards to the mask in the documentary short Halloween Unmasked 2000, released in 1999, it was revealed that the crew had chosen two masks for Michael Myers to decide on. The first was a Don Post Emmett Kelly smiling clown face that they put frizzy red hair on. This was an homage to how he killed his sister Judith in a clown costume. They tested it out and it appeared very demented and creepy. The other mask was the 1975 Captain James T. Kirk mask that was purchased for under $2. It had the eyebrows and sideburns ripped off, the face was painted, fish belly bluish white, and the hair was spray painted brown. The eyes were opened up a little more. They tested out the Kirk mask and the crew decided it was much more creepy because it was emotionless. This became the Michael Myers mask. Halloween was filmed in 20 days over a four week period in May of 1978. Much of the filming was completed using a Steadicam, a then new camera that allowed filmmakers to move around spaces smoothly. Filming locations included South Pasadena, California, Garfield Elementary School in Alhambra, California, and the cemetery at Sierra Madre, California. An abandoned house owned by a church stood in as the Myers house. Two homes on Orange Grove Avenue near Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood were used for the film's climax as the street had few palm trees and thus closely resembled a Midwestern street. Some palm trees, however, are visible in the film's earlier establishing scenes. The crew had difficulty finding pumpkins in the spring and artificial fall leaves had to be reused for multiple scenes. Local families dressed their children in Halloween costumes for trick-or-treat scenes. The film score consists of a piano melody played in a 10-8 or complex 5-4 time signature. <clears throat> Composed and performed by director Carpenter, with Carpenter admitting that the music was inspired by both Dario Argento's Suspiria, which also influenced the film's slightly surreal color scheme, and William Friedkin's, Friedkin's The Exorcist. It took Carpenter three days to compose the entire score for the film. In addition to the film's critical and commercial success, Carpenter's self-composed Halloween theme became the recognizable part from the film. In the end credits, in the end credits, Carpenter bills himself as the Bowling Green Philharmonic Orchestra for performing the film's score, but he did receive assistance from composer Dan Wyman, a music professor at San Jose State University. Some songs can be heard in the film, one being an untitled song performed by Carpenter and a group of his friends who formed the band called The Coupe de Ville's. The song is heard as Laurie steps into Annie's car on her way to babysit Tommy Doyle. Another song, Don't Fear the Reaper, by classic rock band Blue Oyster Cult, appears in the film. In 1980, the television rights to Halloween were sold to NBC for approximately $3 million. After a debate amongst Carpenter Hill and NBC standards and practices over censoring of certain scenes, Halloween appeared on television for the first time in October of 1981. To fill the two-hour time slot, Carpenter filmed 20 minutes of additional material during the production of Halloween 2. The newly filmed scenes include Dr. Loomis at a hospital board review of Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis talking to the then six-year-old Michael at Smith Grove telling him, You fooled them, haven't you, Michael? But not me. Another extra scene features Dr. Loomis at Smith's Grove examining Michael's abandoned cell after he escaped and seeing the word sister scratched into the door. Finally, a scene was added in which Linda comes over to Laurie's house to borrow a silk blast before Laurie leaves to babysit. Just as Andy telephones asking to borrow the same blouse, the new scene had Laurie's hair hidden by a towel. Since Curtis was by then wearing a much shorter hairstyle than she had worn in 1978. In August of 2006, Fangoria reported that Synapse Films had discovered boxes of negatives containing footage cut from the film. One was labeled 1981, suggesting that it was the additional footage from the television version of the film. The footage found unfortunately had no sound in any of the reels, so none of it was used in the final edit. The overall darkness of the film wasn't intentional. The budget simply didn't allow for more lights to be purchased. At the end of the day, the darkness added to the tone of the film. 
The film is pure terror. Everyone fears people breaking into their house, so the film plays the home invasion angle. You have the deranged killer that shows no emotion, so you have no idea why he's after the kids. Keep in mind that Laurie becoming Michael's sister in the second film. That was not the intention of the first film. Michael was just coming home. There are so many iconic scenes in the film. Michael looking over the stairs. Michael tilting his head to look at the victim admiring his work. Michael walking menacingly across the street in no rush to get his victim. The closet scene freaked me out as a kid. Honestly, the entire film terrorized me as a kid. I was way too young when I saw this and I instantly fell in love. I freaked out when I finally saw a print of the film where you could see Michael's face a little. I freaked out when you saw Michael's shape after getting shot. I freaked out every time Michael got up and continued to go after Laurie. So that about wraps this one up. I want to hear from you. Post your thoughts on this video and let me know how Halloween impacted your love for horror. That's it for this episode. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you share this video. Make sure you subscribe. But most of all, make sure you keep it hard. <laughs>